right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you are joining us for the live session or for the recorded session, just wanted to say thank you. And I hope that you're having a great day. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jen Kearney. I am a digital communications manager at McLean Hospital. And I'm super excited about this upcoming session because it's about anxiety and how it relates to our senses. Um, it's incredibly important because, you know, did you all think that we had more than five senses? Maybe not. But over the next hour or so, um, I'm really excited to have Ariana Butel on to teach us what our other senses are, how it taps into our anxiety, and how we can keep it from controlling us, and so much more. Um, last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Ariana before I give the mic over to her. Um, she's incredibly warm and so intelligent that I feel like today's session is going to be more like a conversation with a really brilliant close friend. So uh, Ariana Buteau is a doctor of occupational therapy and is an occupational therapist at McLean Hospital's Pathways Academy, which is a year round day school developed to meet social, sensory, psychological and educational needs of children and adolescents ages six through 22 with autism spectrum disorders. And she's also a professor of pediatrics and mental health at Mass General Hospital's Institute of Health Professions. So Ariana, before I put myself on mute, just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us for the session and please feel free to take the mic and my screen. Thank you, Jen. Those were such kind words. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ariana Buteau, as Jen said, and I'm an occupational therapist with McLean Hospital. So whether you're here today to explore your own experiences or here as a clinician or to help a client or here as a parent or a family member, um, thank you for joining. And I hope that you find this session valuable and um, I provide a new lens for you to explore anxiety and also some resources, whether you are familiar with a lot of this or just getting started. Um, I wanted to provide you with some resources to help you along the way. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, so Jen did a great job explaining my background. Um, a little extra, I have an undergrad degree in psychology and then fine arts, I'm a painter. Um, I, she explained the school I work at for McLean very well, six to 22. I also teach graduate students at the MGH Institute and I have some special interest in trauma-informed care, sensory integration, neurological rehab, pediatrics, and telehealth. And as Jen said, if there's any questions along the way, please um, put them in the chat box. Uh, I'd like, I, like she said, I'd love this to be more of a conversation. Any experiences you'd like to share or insights along with questions or comments, please welcome at any time. And again, any resource I provide for you is going to be um, repeated at the end of the presentation on a, a resource slide for you as well to take with you. So today's objectives. Um, I'd like to start by exploring the connection between sensory and anxiety, then understanding your own personal sensory profile, talking about creating tailored routines for your home and community setting, especially home right now, giving you some resources to help you get started and some question and answer time. So right off the bat, when we're born, our sensory system is all we have to go off of. It's the only information that's being given to us. And our brains are seeking patterns and repetition at all times, even before we're born. All we have is what we can hear, what we can feel, touch, taste, see. And this is the basis of how we navigate our world and where we start from. Our brain wants to be organized. It wants to see patterns because this is what's going to help it react and prepare for what's to come. Brains don't like surprises. So you might already be very familiar from grade school with the main five senses, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch. But we have three more that don't get talked about as often. Vestibular, which is your balance and it lives in your inner ear. 
is how we know where our head is in space and how we're able to balance and coordinate our movements and also affects anything else that has to do with the inner ear. Our proprioception sense is the weight we have on our joints and our bones. It's the gravity we feel. It's how I know my hand is above my head with my eyes shut because we can feel that pull on our bones. And then lastly, we have interoception, which is the insides of our body telling us things, how we know when we're hungry, how we know when we're thirsty, how we know if we're tired. These signals are constantly developing and working towards building up our central nervous system. So this is a great visual of how our central nervous system is built. And if you look at the very bottom of the pyramid, what is there? Our sensory systems. This is the basis of how our central nervous system is built upwards, all the way to the very top, where if all of these things are intact, then we're able to understand our behaviors, our daily living activities, and at the very top, be able to learn something new. So if there's something going on down at the base of this pyramid, it would be much harder to learn something new at the very top. I use this pyramid a lot with my kids at work. It's similar to the one before, except it's a little more about learning and what we need to feel fulfilled in life. And again, at the very, very, very bottom is basic needs, our food, our water, our rest, building up from that, feeling safe, feeling secure, and then building up from that, our psychological needs, our relationships, feeling a part of something, feeling like we are individual, building up our esteem even higher to feel like we can actually accomplish something to up to the very top where we actually have the um, ability to feel self-fulfilled. And so again, if someone, a child, an adult, anyone is not getting these basic needs, how can we expect them to have the ones at the top? So we often associate anxiety with our social world, our emotions, right? We're complicated people, we have complicated lives. Um, a looming event or unresolved feelings. Um, and humans don't really like to think about the feeling of anxiety as being not complicated. Um, there may be more foundational things going on. Remember your pyramid. So our bodies send messages to us at all times. They're absorbing stimuli. Our brain is gathering information, organizing it for us and telling us what we need to do. So if our basic needs aren't being met, it very well could be your body's feeling anxious because you're dehydrated, you're tired, you're hungry. And I think sometimes, I don't know if it's the human ego that doesn't like to think like it's not that simple. And you know what, it's not. There are lots of other factors and experiences and our social world is a huge part of who we are. But I challenge you also to, if you're feeling this overpowering sense of anxiety, to check in with your basics, your bottom of the pyramid. Um, our emotions are not simple, but our body's nervous system is old and it's primitive and evolution is slow. And, you know, back in time, we had to be running away from tigers and handling the elements of the wild world. <laughs> Go dog. Um, so we still have these kind of more simple reactions and simple chemistry going on in our bodies, even though our social life and our social world has gotten complicated. So we remember these sensory experiences from a very, very young age and our body wants to do this, right? We want patterns. So it does this to the point where it starts to become subconscious and our body can turn these things on and off before we really consciously have the choice to. I always like this example of the cat in the top corner. Say you're young and it's the first time you ever meet a cat and you meet the cat on the left. 
And what a great experience. It's soft. Think about the sensory experience of a kitten. It's soft. It's cute. It's got cute kitten noises. You know, it's, it's a pleasant experience. But what if the first time you met a cat, it was a mean cat and it bit you. And so every time now your body sees that cat shape, it hears a cat noise and it's going to remember you got bit. You might be scared of cats. So these very intro type of experiences and interactions we have with the world, they shape how our body reacts to them as we grow. Um, similar examples I have on this slide are things like phobias. Um, there comes a point where it starts to be a big problem in your life, but it's automatic. Our body sees something we're scared of. If you see a spider crawl across your bed sheet, you don't have time to think about your reaction. It's automatic. Or how quickly do we learn as children that going to the doctor could also mean you're gonna get a shot. And we don't like the doctor and we remember that. I also think a lot about um, food poisoning is another good example. Your body will remember if it got sick off something, you may not be able to eat that for a very long time. And in fact, it might be even more primitive and innate that our bodies do this because we're not supposed to eat spoiled food. It's bad, but it'll make us sick. And so not only do these experiences shape our social world, but they, you know, they're there for very important reasons, even today. So your everyone hears this free, and now there's freeze as well. Flight, fright, <laughs> fight, flight, or freeze response. It's a part of your sympathetic nervous system. This is what kicks in when there's an emergency, when you need to react fast. And when you have to react fast, you don't need to remember anything. You don't need to digest. What, what effort of your body would that point be? You know, that's not efficient. You don't need to remember old memories or learn anything new. You don't need to sleep during an emergency. So all of these systems get shut off when your flight or flight response turns on. And even though we're not getting chased by tigers or out in the wilderness necessarily, you know, our basic safety needs and things like that, you know, we, we have different challenges now than we did a long time ago, but we still have these very primitive chemical reactions. And sometimes we can kind of get stuck in this limbo of not being able to calm our, our sensory nervous system down again. And that's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. That's the system that counteracts your fight or flight and brings you back down again. So we need both of these things. Both are very important. Um, but when they start firing at times where it's not efficient for us, what do we do? Our brains have been training itself our whole lives to have these reactions. So what do we do? What can we do? Okay, so part of this might feel like, all right, well, what control do I even have over this if this is so ingrained and so primitive and for however long I've been alive, it's been, you know, patterning this way. What, what control do we have? Okay, so I love this quote. I use it all the time. It's not the strongest of species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So he's talking about adaptation, right? Evolution, this is Charles Darwin. Um, but in this modern day, in our social world, adaptation skills are coping skills. They're the same thing to me. And so when you think about how can I retrain my central nervous system to respond differently so that I can adapt to this world. And so my coping skills are adapting as the world changes. That's what makes us human. That's why we have survived so long. We can do this. So your sensory system is a toolbox. Remember, it's the bottom basic foundation of so many things. Okay, so everyone has Everyone has sensory preferences. This is what parts, this is what makes you a 
the most unique human that you are, that we all are. We all have preferences. It's not um, a, a problem. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Uh, do you like spicy food? Do you care if your hands are dirty? Do you eat things that are slimy, like oysters? Do you wear a face mask to bed? These are sensory preferences, and it's a part of your personality. It's your likes and your dislikes. And we would never want to extinguish that part of you. But when one of these preferences or sensitivities starts to become anxiety or get in the way of your daily life, that's when you might want to start looking into, all right, well, what, what can I be doing to adjust the things I do have control over in my sensory world? So this is one resource I have for you. Um, it is an informal assessment of your own sensory systems going through different types of activities or routines as a checklist. So this is a great way to get started if you've never really dove in um, to checking out your own sensory system and seeing what your own likes and your own dislikes are. This is where I strongly suggest you start something similar to this, if not this, um, really starting to understand, all right, with those eight senses, what are things that actually are calming to me versus things that I dislike? Really start to think about, you know, going through your everyday life, think of going through all eight senses, even digestion, you know, what, what parts of my day am I experiencing these stimuli? What is pleasant to me? What is not? This is what makes you individual. And it's all about personal preference. I also have um, a more formal assessment with me. I just wanted to share just a few questions of what examples of a more formal sensory assessment might ask you. And it's really getting down to these basic everyday things, such as how often do you notice when your name is called or ask people to repeat things or work on more than one task at a time. You might not think that these everyday tasks are sensory experiences, but once you start looking under this lens, you'll realize it affects everything. And then once you start to get a better sense of your own sensory profile, you can start to have more control over how you plan your day, how you set up your environment, and how you design your own routines. So for example, in the community, um, if you notice that grocery shopping, these are just some examples. If you notice that grocery shopping is a time of great stress for you, plan your grocery trip at a time where there's less traffic, where there's not poor weather, um, when you're not already anxious um, around the community, you know, you have control over how much media you are exposed to or those unpleasant sensory experiences I want you to be aware of as well. Not just the ones that are joyful and pleasant, but the ones that are unpleasant. And try and steer clear of too much of that. Be proactive and conscious about that. Um, those are two examples of mine, uh, overdoing it with the media and being in a place where there's crowds right now is very anxious for me. So I just try to avoid that as much as I can. Um, try to explore new interest. Again, coping skills are adaptation skills. And if we can find new coping skills, especially when we're all kind of cooped up at home, you know, be intentional with all your eight senses. Explore, trial and error, find some new things. Within your home environment, you have a lot more control than your community. Um, they say in terms of your bedroom specifically, limit the activities that you're doing in your bedroom besides sleep and sleep related routines. Sometimes when we're all working from home, this can be hard to do, but if you can, try to think about your bedroom as a safe haven for nighttime and sleep routine. And if you can, set up your work from home or school from home separate from your bedroom. Make sure also that that school or work 
environment is calming to you. If you sit down and you don't like your home desk environment, you don't like your school set up, your child set up, it's not calming, then you're setting yourself up to have an anxiety situation, an anxious situation. So you have control over what lighting you have, what type of bedding you have, um, the colors and the items and the decoration you put in your home environment. So also sleep hygiene is a topic that I think we could talk a lot about. Um, so I don't wanna go too into it. I've given you a resource. If sleep is a huge area of stress for you, um, I highly suggest using, uh, exploring more about the term sleep hygiene and then also really thinking about your nighttime routine in terms of your eight senses. So how are you visually setting up your nighttime routine? How are you temperature wise, um, texture wise? Through, go through all of those eight senses and try and check each one of those using what you like and what you dislike. Be purposeful about how you're setting up your home and your office. I also highly suggest no matter what age, creating a safe space in your house. Um, I sometimes with my students call this a calming corner and it doesn't have to be completely private. I know we all live with families and roommates and it's hard to find a moment alone sometimes, especially as a parent, um, but it should have a general sense of privacy. Uh, it should include some sensory items, and I'll go in in a minute about what a sensory bin is. And I really like to include some, because I prefer visual stimuli, I like to include a lot of pictures, quotes that I find powerful, decorations. And again, remember all your eight senses. So this is a great opportunity to set up ahead of time. Um, and a place to go when you feel that your anxiety is getting a little overwhelming. As a child, you could set this up to be very child friendly, but as an adult, this can look like um, a space in a larger closet, a corner of your room, uh, setting it up just so it's specifically for a place for you to go when you're feeling like a little, you're a little out of control of your anxiety and you need a moment to be grounded. A sensory bin is really just a bowl, a box, any vessel filled with sensory preference items that you know help you relieve feelings of anxiety. Um, our brains want to feel organized, right? So do you know, an example of a really, really common sensory toolkit or a sensory bin might have some weighted items, um, some stress balls or things that are squishy that you can squeeze, some fidgets, some small toys or games, glitter jars, things like that, small candies. And these are things that are specifically for your safe space or for when you are struggling with your anxiety. These are not meant to play when you are not anxious. These are some resources I have for you too that are great visuals to have in your safe space or your calm corner. Um, these are called sensory check-ins. And so as you go through, you can do this in your mind um, or sometimes having the visual is very helpful. Going through the room and focusing on finding five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. You can kind of go through that at your own pace it can be a simple visual like the one on the right or something a little more decor decorative on the left. Um, I use both of these quite a lot. So I have those for you available as well. And again, I want to point out on the one on the left, on the bottom, it says you are here and you are safe. And so much with anxiety, thinking about the basis of your pyramid. Remember, we need safety in order to move forward, in order to learn and grow 
feel ourselves. Safety and security is at the bottom of our pyramid, just like our sensory systems are. And we want all of those to feel secure. So there's a lot of talk about deep pressure and why is that so therapeutic to so many people? So of all the eight senses, deep pressure mostly affects our proprioceptive input, which is the gravity on our joints, right? It puts pressure on our joints and muscles. It gives our brain a better sense of where our body is in relation to space and the world around us. So remember when you're um, autonomic nervous system is firing off. You have your fight or flight, your sympathetic nervous system. Deep pressure can calm that down and rebalance your central nervous system back to being equilibrium, which is where we want to be. So you see a lot of service dogs. I think that proprioceptive input, that deep pressure is why they're so calming at times. You can also use things like sleeping bags, bean bags. They have excellent tools and resources out there in the world for things like pressure vests and um, deep massage, therapy balls, brushing. Okay. So a big thing that I do with the kids I work with who experience anxiety is being very proactive about their sensory breaks and scheduled sensory time. So what I mean by that is whether we call it a sensory break or a movement break, these breaks should be five or 10 minutes. They should be pre-scheduled into your daily routine. Um, not only should this be something that you have pre-scheduled daily, but it's also a crisis management opportunity as well to do as you notice that you're starting to escalate in your anxiety, or even as you realize that you're starting to calm down, this could be a great opportunity to practice a sensory or movement break before or after a stressful event. Um, and again, remember all eight of your senses and your own personal profile, what grounds you. Um, an example, a 10-year-old boy I work with between these remote class settings, between, this, between classes in his remote setting, um, has a visual up on his wall and he will do 10 jumping jacks, five yoga poses, three deep breaths, and one positive affirmation. And the big one he chooses is, Today will be a good day. I can handle this day. So that's a good example of a movement break, a sensory break that you can do in between your daily activities, but also as a way to handle some more unexpected anxiety. Uh, as an adult, I'm trying to make this um, applicable to children and adults. So as an adult, something you might do is, you know, depending on what your likes and dislikes are, put headphones on and take a walk around the block. Um, put your screen and your phone away for five minutes. And this might be something you do three times a day or uh, going downstairs to get a cup of tea and maybe engaging in one of those other visuals, going to your calm corner, taking a break and then returning to what was making you anxious. So I highly encourage pre-scheduling these, being proactive and being intentional about these. These are not necessarily meant to handle moments of severe anxiety. These are meant to be proactive so that it can be avoided, so that you're practicing your grounding sensory experiences throughout your day. This is an example of a visual I use with kids who like Star Wars or adults who like Star Wars. You do 10 of each as a movement break. I also use this one a lot where it's with a die. So if you're not, if you're someone who likes to mix it up and doesn't necessarily like to do the same things all the time, um, you could incorporate something like this as a sensory break or a movement break. I highly encourage visuals. I think it takes the accountability off of your memory. 
Um, and it also gives you kind of a consistent uh, go-to as instruction. I also in, uh, incorporated some body scans, both for children and adults as resources for you. These are great sensory breaks. They're just a few minutes long. And if you're someone who maybe doesn't want the accountability on themselves to decide what to do, uh, there's a lot of great apps and websites, but these are two great things from YouTube I use for body scans. They're a few minutes long. Uh, you can do these with headphones on while you're on a bus or while you're grocery shopping, but you can also do them sitting with your eyes shut and just listening to someone else guide you through a quick grounding meditation. These are great sensory breaks. Again, you might not be someone who has the patience to sit and listen and movement breaks might be your sensory breaks. So again, it depends on your personal profile. And again, please don't forget about the power of expression. Um, human hearts have all the feelings, uncomfortable and not uncomfortable, and, and just uncomfortable and not. And so the arts are a great way to express those emotions safely. And it's also a super sensory rich experience. Think about all eight senses and how many of those are touched by arts and crafts and creating something with your hands. Occupational therapy is actually based on the idea that using your hands to create something meaningful, something purposeful is therapy in itself. And so no matter your age, I encourage you, if you're not interested in arts and crafts, but if you are, I encourage you to really start exploring that world, especially while we're all home right now. This is an excellent example of a sensory activity or a sensory break that you could continuously work on as well. These are also two examples of crafts that I've done with kids and teenagers to work on visuals for their own anxiety. The one on the left, you trace your hand and each finger is one of the main senses and you remember a positive memory uh, from your past. And so this can go in your calm corner or your safe space. You put that memory in the middle of the palm and you report on the things you remember from each sense from that specific memory. This child where I'm playing with my dog in the park and everything that they remember seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And then at the bottom, I can carry a positive memory with me in my hand. I can remember it with all of my senses to help it feel real in my mind. So this is a great visual to have um, and a great activity, crafts, sensory, all combined uh, that creates a nice visual if you can put anywhere that's helpful. On the right, I talk a lot about happy brain versus worried brain. You know, we have, we have two wolves in us, a happy wolf and a worried wolf. Which one wins, right? The one you feed. So really examining through a craft, through expression, you know, what those two different mindsets feel and how often they're facing each other. And again, a visual and a craft goes so far in the sensory world as well. On a more primary um, starting point, if you have younger children or work with younger children, I like to do sensory scavenger hunts. There's a lot of other materials like this on the internet. Um, again, five things I love to look at, walking around your house, walking around outside, or things I love to feel, things I love to smell, to listen to, to taste. So these are great starting points to start exploring your own sensory profile, start exploring senses in general, um, especially if you work with younger children. And then start using this language around them, getting, you know, getting used to the idea that the sensory system is something we talk about, something we consider, and we don't forget about. If you walk away with anything today, I'd love for you to walk away with knowing that you can't learn new things when you're anxious. 
Remember your pyramid. Learning new things comes at the very top when we feel safe, when we feel secure, when all of our basic needs are met. And so while you're starting to explore these new sensory strategies or trialing these new activities, I strongly suggest you do this at a time when you're not experiencing anxiety. You will only set yourself up to create an even more anxious experience. It's not familiar, it's new, and your sensory system is not able to absorb it in a way where you're going to learn something new from it. So please, please try these new ideas and explore these new things um, when you're in a calm space. Or if you're working with clients or your own children or children, please make sure they're in a calm space before introducing anything new. Okay, so overall today, your coping skills are adaptation skills. Your senses are your toolbox. And while at home, please do your best to be proactive and intentional with all eight of your senses. I strongly encourage you to uh, start to understand and explore your own sensory preferences and use the large amount of resources that are out there and the few that I've provided today. Um, it's not all in your own head. Please use resources and visuals and, and checklists to get you started, just to start understanding, you know, you might not realize a certain like or a dislike is a sensory preference. So start really using that lens in your everyday life as you go through your daily routines. Really think about what you're doing from a sensory perspective. Also check your room, check your office setup, make sure it matches those sensory preferences. You're automatically setting yourself up to have an anxious day at working from home. If you hate your home office and it's cluttered and stressful or a hard night of sleep, if you've been in your bedroom all day doing a ton of things and you, you know, your sleep hygiene doesn't match your sensory preferences. Again, I encourage everyone, no matter what age, to create a safe space, a calm corner for yourself for when your anxiety gets to be too uncomfortable. And in that safe place, please put things up that make you feel grounded. Um, put sensory items in there intentionally that help you. Again, try all these things when you're not anxious so that you know they do, that you do find them pleasant and keep them in your safe space for when you feel anxious. And I encourage you to physically get up and go to that safe space when you're feeling anxious, um, even if it's just for a few minutes. Again, practice sensory grounding techniques when calm, not when anxious, please. And don't forget about your most basic needs. I know that we are complicated animals, but Sometimes, I mean, I challenge you to make sure all of your basic needs, all of those bottom pyramid things are checked off before you start diving into, um, you know, all of the different social scenarios and memories and things like that that have caused you other factors of anxiety. So you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Please, uh, especially during these times, be easy on yourself and others. This is another great resource as an adult. So you can use as a uh, self-compassion and a be easy on yourself exercise. It's really wonderful. Um, but so I say this out loud to you and I say this for myself. May everyone here and may I feel safe feel happy, feel healthy, and live with ease. I think that's a wonderful um, mantra that you could have for yourself. And I'll leave that resource for you to explore on your own. I highly encourage that one. And I use this quote. I really like to end with a quote. And I know we still have question and answer time, but this is a great quote. Life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Do not resist them. That only creates sorrow. 
Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. And so during times like this, we might not feel like we have a ton of control over what's going on, pandemics to politics, you know, there's a lot we don't have control over. But remember that it's not the strongest that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that's most adaptive and responsive to change. So you have your sensory toolkit, that is your adaptation kit, and I encourage you to really explore that and develop your own sensory toolkit, your own coping sensory toolkit. I think that's it. Yes, I'd love to open the stage up for some questions. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Ariana. I think that this was super helpful. Um, first and foremost, do you have any suggestions for what resources we can use to better understand our own sensory preferences? I understand that a lot of times with individuals with anxiety, it's almost harder for them to determine what truly works for them versus the attitude of being like, it's fine. And then, you know, we know what we definitely don't like, but how do we know whether we can determine whether or not it's fine versus it's actually beneficial? Absolutely. Um, and I think this is the the trickier part because everyone is so individualized that there again i provided a few kind of checklist based resources that really uh break apart the different senses um, and there are a lot of resources like that out there if you're interested in more of a formal assessment or an evaluation that's something you could speak to an occupational therapist about or another professional that um, covers sensory integration sensory processing if it's starting to become a, a huge part of your life, then I would encourage you to talk to someone about it. But in terms of, you know, it is easy to list off all the things we don't like. Um, focusing on finding things you do like. I, I think that you'd be surprised at uh, how often we are interacting with these stimuli every single day. So I encourage you to maybe not look at it as such a macro level, but start paying attention to those small things. What scent is your soap at your sink right now? Um, what, what cloth is your sheets on your bedding? So not necessarily focusing on the world of things that you could like, but what's already going on in your life that you have found that you like that maybe was subconscious that you didn't even realize, oh, actually, I use a lot of blue in my decorating. Um, maybe that's a color that I'm really drawn to and it calms me. Um, so those more kind of finite, smaller details can actually give you a lot of information about yourself. I encourage you to start there and use some of the resources that are online that are kind of a breaking down the senses via a checklist. Um, and then if you still feel stuck, I really would encourage you to seek out some professional help where there's more of a standardized assessment process. Um, so someone asked uh, that they have a child with OCD that reacts to sensory things. Is there some kind of testing that can be done? And if so, what kind of tests should they be looking for? So in terms of sensory standardized assessments, there are a lot out there for children and adults. There's the sensory profile two, which is a great standardized assessment, the sensory processing measure, the teen sensory tool. Um, again, these are all administered by an occupational therapist. Um, but there, there is a world of sensory standardized testing that exists out there if that's the route you're interested in. Um, do you have any suggestions for any obsessive thoughts that are related to anxiety? Yes, I, finding, I find that actually is a lot with anxiety. You start to get anxious about being anxious and then it starts to become this vicious cycle. Um, again, that's where, so I can give you some, some hard examples of things I use in my profession, but again, it's tailored to those specific sensory profiles. Um, one, someone I work with has a lot of intrusive thoughts during moments of anxiety. And so we do a ripping sheet where they will write their anxious thought and rip it up and throw it away. Or you can blow a balloon 
and write in what's bothering you and put it in your balloon, blow it up and tie it off. Pop it if you wanna get rid of it, throw it away if you wanna keep it out of mind. A lot of those more kind of symbolic, um, hands-on tasks I find can be a little more helpful than things like talking about it. Especially with children, if you can avoid words and that type of language-based um, interaction as much as possible using things like images and our sensory system inputs. And I find that kids respond well to that, that type of intervention more so than, you know, tell me what's going on, tell me what's wrong. Um, could you explain the difference between body sense and organ sense? Absolutely. So tactile, um, well, so those, the images on those senses might be what's confusing. So there's tactile, which is touch, which is your skin and the input that we have when we feel. Then you have proprioception, which is the gravity on your joints. And then you have interoception, which is your organs giving you signals for what they need and your inner body telling you the things that it needs. So interception is inner signals. Uh, tactile is physical touch. And proprioception is the gravity on your joints. I hope that answers the question. I think so. That's a helpful explanation. Um, someone wrote in saying the idea of seeking a safe space seems to contradict the major technique of anxiety treatment I'm aware of, which is exposure and not retreating to a safe space. Can you comment on the differences? Absolutely. So I work with a very unique population um, where exposure causes a little more anxiety. Um, so I, I'm not uh, disregarding the idea that exposure has helped a lot of people but sometimes it can also be re-triggering and uh, depending on you know, your past experiences, this, this might not be the best approach and it might need a balance. But when I say take a safe space, I don't mean um, retreat from anxiety. Um, I, would, I don't want you to think about that when you are in your safe space, I just, with everyone home and so many potential people in your house or not able to leave your home to go to places that normally would help, um, this is an example for your child, for yourself, to create a calm space where those stimuli that are uncomfortable are not there and where things that do ground you are. So it's a strategy it's not meant to stay in there all day and avoid the world. It's meant to take a break and rejoin. So I know that you had mentioned the, the times that we're living in, which specifically, you know, if you're joining us live, it's COVID. Um, and it's made it increasingly harder to see people go out and do things. Do you have any suggestions for uh, viewers to support people who are loved ones that are anxious that don't live with them? Mm -hmm. Right. That's a hard, well, I think of a lot of things. I think having them create their own sensory bin, I'm not sure how able they are in their own home, but a lot of kind of everyday items could go in this. Um, there are a lot of tools online as well, sensory tools, if they don't have items that would really help them or get that. But again, that is the struggle that a lot of us are going through is how do we interact with humans? We're social beings is this is zoom enough um and so yeah i think that's a that's a struggle that a lot of people are experiencing is how do we take care of our family members that don't live with us um that's a great question i'm not quite sure i think even just acknowledging too that you you recognize their anxiety and that you are there as an outlet to just reach and you're just reaching out that might actually be a really good starting point there are a lot of great um, things happening right now, like, um, you know, with, with, uh, through the fire come, through the ashes grows new life. And so while a lot of people are struggling, struggling right now, there are a lot of new things happening because of this, um, you know, virtual groups and support groups and online, online painting classes and virtual tours of places around the world. So I do encourage you to explore some of those resources as well, just so you don't feel so isolated. 
Do you have any suggestions for teachers to use sensory tools or any ideas that they can use with their students because you can't be sharing physical manipulative tools? Great, that's a great point. Um, uh, I always, and I don't want to get into a soapbox, but uh, I, if a child needs a sensory tool, their school should have some part in it being incorporated into their IEP if they have one, being incorporated into their class routine. Um, that should not be a problem in your child's classroom. And I would, you know, I'm a big fan of you don't get what you don't ask for. So I would encourage you to ask the school if they would be willing to supply some sensory materials while you are at home during remote learning. Um, I do have to say, I am unfamiliar with the phrase IEP. Can you just explain that a little bit? Um, that's in a school setting, if a child, if a child might have an individualized education plan or program, and um, that is where it's a governing document that says they not only um, need these things, it is required for their education. And so the school and the district has to follow that throughout the year. Um, a lot of the students I work with, sensory tools, sensory breaks, movement breaks, fidgets, things like that are all ingrained in their IEP. So it, it's uh, required for them to have access to that at all times. And is the IEP something that you would, as a parent, you would champion? Is that something you have to approach the school about or your provider? Again, every district is different. And again, you don't often get what you don't ask for. So as a parent, I would encourage you to speak up and ask those questions. Um, another saying, I'm a big quote person, if you can't tell, um, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I would really encourage you, you know, you know, there's so much going on and so much kind of seeping through the cracks um, with school right now. So I encourage you to speak up and ask, you know, what, what materials can I have? He has sensory, he or she has sensory needs. Um, what are you going to do as a school district to help accommodate that? Um, could you speak a little bit to quote, highly sensitive people or those who have sensory processing sensitivities? Um, so hype, yeah, so for those who are unfamiliar with those terms, like a hypersensitivity to one of those stimuli would mean of all those eight senses, you might have one or a few that you're extremely hypervigilant of, uh, very sensitive to, to the point where it becomes uh, everyday things for one person might be extremely uncomfortable for another. And so really learning about, you know, how the control you have in setting up your environment, your home, um, so that you're not only, uh, not necessarily avoiding that stimuli altogether, but that you're balancing it with stimuli that you find pleasant and grounding as well. Some things we can't avoid. Um. All right. I mean, speaking of things that you can't avoid, um, someone wrote in saying that their safe place is their bedroom and they find it hard to sleep anywhere else. Do you have tips for getting comfortable in hotel rooms or other locations? Yes, so oh, that, that is such a great question based on the sensory system. So think about what makes a hotel uncomfortable for you. What makes your bedroom comfortable? It's your familiar smells, it's your familiar touches, it's your familiar um, sheets, your bed, your things, your lighting. It's the whole sensory experience is familiar to you. And so if you're someone who has to travel a lot for work, I would encourage, why not? Bring your own sheets, bring your own pillow. Um, bring some pictures that you have in your bedroom, you know, set it up a little bit more intentionally so you have some of that sensory famili familiarity. So when talking about sleep, um, what if we wake up anxious in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep? Are there any exercises that you had mentioned or others that you'd recommend that would work well for getting us to quiet our minds and drift back into a beautiful REM cycle? Absolutely. So a good suggestion is don't sit there thinking about how you can't sleep. So if you wake up in the middle of the night, and this happens to me all the time, and you find that you're too anxious to get comfortable again, I really encourage you to get up, go look at the moon at three in the morning, have a glass of water, um, give yourself five minutes out of your bed, and maybe read a few pages of a book, um, write in a diary, have some type of outlet or grounding 
maybe go to your calm corner, do a few visuals, do something that takes about five minutes that might be a little bit of a distraction from the fact that you can't sleep. And then try again. And don't get mad at yourself if you have to do that three times. Um, try again for 10, 15 minutes. Doesn't work, get up and do it again. That's one, stra that's one strategy you could try of, of lots of them. Again, I put a sleep hygiene resource at the end of the presentation, which goes into depth. That is a really important subject. Um, and if you struggle with sleep, I highly suggest looking at that resource. And I'll be sure to include all of these in the follow-up resource. We'll have it in the URL, so that way folks can just click whatever they want. Um, just a couple more questions. I know that your time is incredibly valuable. Um, if you are a parent of multiple children who have very different sensory preferences, how do you accommodate that in your home without you feeling like you're going to lose it? That is a hard one, and I, my heart goes out to families who have um, several children, all with a variety of needs, working in the house right now. Um, you can, again, you can do everything. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. So try, do your best, and my biggest suggestion in hearing that is making sure you're also taking care of you, um, because if you're getting your own sensory needs met, then, you know, we're trying to teach our children how to be independent and how to navigate and understand themselves. And so if you can model that, I think that's a great place to start. I don't think that it can control the house chaos, <laughs> um, but I think that you can absolutely, as an example, lead the way for using sensory tools as a calming strategy. Do you have time? I know we're at the hour, but do you have time for two more questions? I do have time, absolutely. Awesome. So we had someone ask if you can't take a break, but you have to keep going in a highly stressful, high paced job. How do you stay calm if your anxiety and your time pressure keeps escalating? Again, my mind immediately goes to you don't get what you don't ask for. And a, a place of employment, um, if you need a sensory break, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, the specifics of your job, but I'd be surprised if that's something that you need to regulate yourself, that your place of employment wouldn't allow you to have a five minute um, break in a quiet space or, you know, those same type of accommodations we would give kids with certain um, things going on. I, again, I would, you know, you don't get what you don't ask for. So if that's something that you think really would benefit your work environment, um, I would ask your boss, you know, I, I struggle with anxiety and I need a sensory break, you know, once a day, twice a day, whatever you think, you know, be your own advocate. You never know what they'll say. So I know that you've said multiple times you don't get what you don't ask for. So I'm going to take your advice and I'm going to ask a question because I'm curious and I would like an answer. And then we can end the session after this. Um, weighted blankets, are they a gimmick or are they legit for anxiety? And because there's so many options for them with all different weights, how do you actually know what's good for you? Or is it kind of, you have to try it before you buy it? That's a great question. I think that, again, that's why I brought up deep pressure because it's being thrown around a lot as a strategy, but the science behind it says it should be 10% of your body weight and no more than 20 minutes. Otherwise it starts to have a fatiguing effect. Um, where it gets you okay. tired. So if that's the goal, if it's for sleep, that might not necessarily be the worst thing. But if it's to calm your anxiety, there is a, there is a specific kind of um, protocol, 10% of your body weight, 20 minutes at a time. That's a really helpful rule of thumb. So I'm glad I asked the question. Um, we did have an individual suggest a resource that's called SALT. It's Senior Alternative Learning and Travel. Um, it's virtual, available worldwide, and it's to ease isolation and anxiety for adults. So it's online classes for seniors. Um, they do virtual travel. They do arts and crafts. They do discussion groups. So in case anybody is listening, that's a resource that could be used for folks who might be isolated because of age or health condition. Um, but just wanted to pass along thank you to whoever sent that recommendation in. Um, and that actually concludes our session. So Ariana, thank you so much. This has been so valuable and so helpful. Um, from everybody who's joined, I wanna say thank you. Um, until next time, just enjoy your day and take some deep breaths. So Ariana, thanks again. And thank you all for joining. Yeah. Have a great day.